We're very fortunate to have with us tonight, uh, as the Brannigan Lecturer uh, from the Institute for Advanced Study, Professor <coughs> Lawrence Buell, the Powell M. Cabot Professor of American Literature at Harvard University. For any historian uh, or literary scholar who specializes in 19th century America, and, and I am one of those, Professor Buell has long been a leading light in the field. My first encounter with his work was as a needy graduate student in the mid-1980s, trying to catch up on the almost complete revision of antebellum American literary culture. Uh, the paperback reprint of Literary Transcendentalism, which had been published originally in 1973, was, for me, essential reading uh, in that re-education. Professor Buell continues to make strange and alive again texts and moments we thought we understood and had remained where we last put them. Emerson, 2003, winner of the Warren Brooks Award for Outstanding Literary Criticism, is an example. But Professor Buell's work has also extended well beyond the specialist provinces of antebellum studies. He has been a major force, a shaping force, in the field of eco-criticism, publishing three major texts between 1995 and 2005 that have outlined new avenues for inquiry. Writing for an Endangered World, Literature, Culture, and Environment in the United States and Beyond was awarded the Wealth Prize by the Popular Culture and American Culture Associations. Three years ago, in recognition of his 35 years sustained achievement, Professor Buell received the J. Hubble Award for Lifetime Contributions to American Literary Studies. I spent some time this afternoon with Larry in the, the um, Americanist Research Colloquium with graduate students at four, in which he made it clear he does not like long introductions. <laughs> so I will <laughs> cut this short and ask Larry to come up and uh, speak to us. He also has said that he will carry, uh, he will uh, manage his own Q&A. So when he's done, he'll let you know that, and we'll have at it after that. Uh, we'll have a reception immediately following. Professor Buell. Thanks, Jonathan. I very much appreciate the kind and also homey touch. Uh, feel right at home. Although I think that I should invite you all to sit around the fireplace. You know, this is a little uh, odd, this configuration at a, at a distance here. Yes, Ivana, you should uh, feel free uh, to approach. I want to raise this up. I'm delighted to be here. Um, Beautiful spring, I feel munificently treated. I hope to give something in return. Can you all hear me okay in the back? Bring it up a little bit. Ah. Or maybe I need to stoop. How's that? It's uncomfortable. Oh, I'm not too proud to bend. That's fine. Uses and abuses of environmental memory, that's my, my theme. Uh, these two terms, environment and memory, are both notoriously elastic, as any user knows. Uh, environment is definable either with a tilt towards the sociocultural or towards the material, which in turn can mean either or both non-human nature or oppositely human built constructs as in architectural or design environment. Uh, not to mention environments more purely metaphorical connotations like hostile or welcoming environment, that kind of phraseology. Environment can refer to hugely different spatial scales from local to planetary, uh, can imply sharply discrepant uh, degrees of distance or impingement upon the observer. Uh, either spectatorial distance uh, from a surround uh, or interactivity with that surround, uh, as in uh, English usage before the 1800s, uh, which was as a verb rather than a noun. Memory. Memory can tilt either towards the mind work of a particular individual or paradigmatic person, as in cognitive science, phenomenology, traditional mnemonic regimes that assist recall, uh, or it can tilt towards uh, the idea of some kind of social process or collective result. Uh, 
Well, I'm going to be using both terms quite flexibly, variously in this talk, but in ways context should, I hope, make clear. By environmental memory, which is an uncommon phrase with no set definition, I'm going to mean the apprehension, whether or not conscious, whether or not accurate, whether or not socially shared, of environments as lived experience in the fourth dimension. Or in other words, uh, the intimation, however fitfully grasped at a conscious level, of human life and history as being carried on in the context of human embeddedness in webs of shifting environmental circumstance of some duration. Sometimes, uh, indeed, understood as stretching far back into prehistory. Occasionally, also uh, forward in time as speculative projections of futurity, memory of the future, uh, if the phrase is not too paradoxical. Well, this is a sweeping definition, but sweeping though it is, it still is not all inclusive. Uh, two conspicuous emissions here are non human memory, primate, cetacean, avian, etc., uh, and with respect to humans, carriers of memory at the pure, purely corporeal level, uh, genetically, for instance, uh, including, if you accept the hypothesis, so called biophilia, uh, the theory that humans have instinctive affiliation for other life forms. In the uh, longer version of this project, I do also want to take these dimensions into account, for sure. Uh, what interests me especially here is the capacity of uh, expressive media across arts and letters to act as retrievers, conduits, reinforcers of environment, environmental memory over against the inertial force of what uh, the environmental psychologist Peter Kahn Jr. has called intergenerational environmental amnesia, uh, a condition no doubt as long-lasting as the felt need to tutor the young, uh, but surely exaggerated and aggravated by uh, anthropogenic environmental change since Industrial Revolution began and accelerating in our time. Uh, the archive I will draw on is mostly literary texts that uh, offer simulations or models of environmental memory as lived experience, whether collective or personal, over different time scales. And the four scales that I'll be uh, surveying here are in turn human history imagined as participating in a much longer bio geological history that extends well beyond any one human lifetime, That number one. Number two, individual lifelines uh, imagined as shaped through symbiotic relation to place. Three and four, uh, communities and nations imagined as formatively shaped by social or collective processes of remembering, defining culture in terms of connectedness to place or physical environment. Well, I'm offering this uh, fourfold not as an authoritative taxonomy, but as a serviceable kind of uh, heuristic that I hope will allow for a broad enough kind of reconnaissance within our time frame. Uh, doubtless, this is a framework that needs refinement. I truly welcome your feedback uh, at the end of this. This is work in progress, and uh, I'm only at the still relatively early stages of uh, congealment here. Number one, then, biogeological memory, as I'm calling it. Here I'm going to take up a series of attempts to imagine human history as rightfully but one strand of ecological history. The wildlife biologist Aldo Leopold, uh, sometimes called the father of modern environmental ethics, once wrote that to be an ecologist is to live alone in a world of wounds. 
Uh, he's referring specifically to the plight of the conscienceful scientist distressed at land abuse and shrinking biodiversity that others didn't even seem to notice. His best known book was written against that, Sand County Almanac. It's a classic of modern nature writing whose opening section centers on an abandoned farm that he bought during the Depression, partly as a family retreat, but mainly as a, a kind of personal, familial, environmental restoration project. One way that uh, this book gives weight to such otherwise unremarkable acts as uh, sawing wood, planting trees, is to stretch the horizon of environmental memory decades and even centuries back into the past. Uh, it tells towards the start the story of regional history in reverse while sawing through the rings of an oak tree that sprouted in the mid-19th century before Wisconsin became a state. Uh, later it recalls uh, the story of uh, aggressive marsh draining by Midwestern settlers that drastically shrank wildlands and with it migratory bird populations. Thrusts like these seek to induce readers to think of themselves, too, as remorseful legatees of the one-sided one co-evolution of land and settler. Leopold's concentration on the era of Euro settlement, though, mind-expanding though it may seem to readers today, is really quite foreshortened if you set it next to the Osage writer John Joseph Matthews, sometimes called the Native American Thoreau. Uh, here's how Matthews frames his experiment in solitary cabin living in the 1930s and 40s, a uh, 10 year duration as against Henry David's two and a fraction. Long before I came to the blackjack is a species of pine that defines the bioregion in the American Midwest that he writes from. Long before I came there as an insignificant bit of life made powerful by a birthright resulting from man's progress through the centuries. The ridges had no topographic importance, but were a part of high lands capped either by sandstone or a later member of the carboniferous limestone now a part of the Mississippi Delta, or resting on the floor of the Gulf of Mexico. There's a kind of dry reportorial tone here that's designed it. It, it fortifies the sense of uh, a spatial and historical vista that's so immense that the persona almost disappears into it, uh, giving a, uh, an ironic turn to that grand phrase, man's progress through the centuries, that's embedded in this, miniaturing uh, himself as an insignificant bit of life. <coughs> Writing concurrently with Leopold and during World War, that is during World War II and just after, and as an elder of an embattled tribe on whose behalf he dutifully spends a good bit of time each year lobbying in Washington, even though he doesn't like it there, this Matthews is no less aware of the world's woundedness, of how the Amer Europeans, uh, as he calls them, ran berserk on this new continent. And if that passage I quoted seems to shut history and politics out, it's because of the underlying sociobiological -bi conviction that not just his generation, but all of humankind still stands at a primitive stage of evolution, bound much more than we admit to the organismic life cycle and to an exceedingly slow process of natural selection that's going to work uh, the same way, much the same way for all species, like it or not. And with weird sounding but rigorous self-consistency, Matthews uh, repeatedly uses uh, the epithet ornamental uh, to mark any thought or act that would attempt uh, would tempt you to feel otherwise, uh, himself included. Now, he admits to liking radio broadcasts of football and uh, opera, uh, but immediately he belittles this as ornamental. 
uh, compared to the biotic limits within which his mind body must live out its small life. Well, all this makes for a very different kind of environmental memory work from Aldo Leopold's. Leopold, wanting to reverse human degradation of natural systems, puts front and center the figure of the anxiously conscientious practitioner of good land stewardship, as in, whoever owns land has assumed, whether he knows it or not, the divine functions of creating and destroying plants. Whereas Matthews, who's no less convinced that humanity is but one member of a larger land community, it's a Leopold phrase, opts for a kind of cheerful fatalism by contrast, hopeful that the species will become less destructive, but certain that it can't evade evolutionary law. The historian Simon Schama complains in Landscape and Memory that environmental historians always undermine what's most original about their project by assigning uh, the land uh, a certain kind of plot role, assigning the land and climate the kind of uh, creative unpredictability conventionally uh, reserved for human actors, but then uh, harnessing them to routinely dismal plots in which the environment always loses. This is Shama's complaint. I think he's right about the plot, but not about the complaint. Uh, insofar as planetary history, uh, since industrialization anyhow, has largely been a story of incremental human impact. Uh, but environmental imagination as a memory building project is not bound to that one plot. Uh, aesthetic texts are as if statements that hold the promise of reorienting vistas by pressing the contrast between the is and the might be. Uh, they can build on the biocentric premise of necessary human interdependence with land, either Leopold fashion or Matthews fashion, or in other ways entirely. Uh, as with uh, ecotopian sci-fi thought experiments uh, with alternative worlds. Uh, case in point, Ursula Le Guin's uh, Vaster Than Empires and More Slow, uh, a novella where astronauts uh, confront an unknown planet uh, that's comprised of a network of sentient plants of global scope. Uh, this text teases out the implications of uh, bioengineer James Lovelock's uh, theory of Earth as a single holistic macroorganism, which he insists on calling Gaia, after the Greek Earth goddess. Uh, this to the delight of neo-paganists, but the perplexity of many scientists who have forced Lovelock uh, over the years into uh, hedging and recalibration as to the exact nature of this Gaian being. Uh, what weight, if any, to attach to the personification except as an arresting uh, metaphor for a biomechanical process. Whereas the Gwyn, on the other hand, is free to construct uh, thought experiments about human alienation from planetary holism without bogging down in technicalities of that sort. This flexibility to frame uh, alternative scenarios for environmental memory is really one of art's strongest suits, as I take it though it has uh, a vulnerable downside too, and we will come to that. Nor does a science fiction or any other genre have uh, a monopoly on this kind of thing. Uh, the Afrikaner ethnographer mystic uh, Lawrence Vanderpost invokes what he calls the great memory of the timescape of the Kalahari Bushmen to protest uh, the scandal of their displacement. Uh, Australian environmental historian Tim Flannery in uh, The Future Eaters, other books too, uh, dramatizes a still more ancient continental environmental memory that situates even the advent of the Aborigines 50,000 years before Euro settlement uh, within the context of a much, much longer geologic biologic time scale that stretches back to the dispersion of the primal continent Gondwana land. Uh, New England, uh, New Zealand, I'm sorry, New England, I'm uh, 
showing my provincialism. New Zealand uh, ecologist Jeff Parks' uh, experimental travel narrative, Na Aurora, it's called, The Groves of Life, translation of the Maori. Um, narrative in the tradition of Darwin's Voyage of the Beagle or Wallace's Malay Archipelago follows the author's uh, sorties into remnant wildlands of North and South Islands, uh, shuttling mentally back and forth as he goes along a time scale from prehistory um, to Euro contact to the now, uh, between settler and first people's voices, often internally divergent, and panning out and back uh, from this or that rare plant under view to its distribution throughout Polynesia and the intertwined natural history of its migration to that spot and its uses as foodstuff by both human and animal. Now, all this in pursuit of the claim that the, uh, the unlikely but possible survival of the sense of native plants, soils, climatic soil, climactic soils, climate cycles, and life forces as necessary ingredients of how we actually live uh, is certain to be uh, as much a matter of spirit and ritual as of ecology and policy. As much a matter of spirit and ritual as of ecology and policy. Well, the ritual that he has in mind here, it's not Maori primordialism or anything like that. It's rather the conjuring from fragments that the book itself is trying to perform here and transmit to the reader. Uh, kind of inverse complement of this would be uh, the environmental journalist Alan Weissman's uh, recent book, The World Without Us, uh, which is a book of... Uh, researched futurology that speculates about how long it would take the planet to recover from us if Homo sapiens suddenly became extinct. But enough on uh, this first frame, biogeologic memory, at least for now. Taken on its own terms, uh, it seems to me deeply informative and help, help, helpfully decentering at best. A downside of the decentering move, though, would be that to the extent that it aspires to fashion a paradigmatic uh, regional or continental or planetary memory, it can easily wind up coming across as, as nobody's memory, nobody in particular. And that may be one reason why uh, some of the experiments that I've scrolled through often favor the narrative frame uh, within which Leopold, Matthews, Park all operate. And that's the device of a particular figure embedded within uh, some sort of regional environment that's vicariously ranging back and forth across the epochs of time. And with this, we come to frame two, uh, environmental memory as extension of personal being. Memory work of the second kind uh, positions itself no less vigorously against the amnesiac effects of industrial modernization, uh, which, as uh, the architectural critic Malcolm Quantrill mordantly writes, traps its denizens in a sort of eternal present that has no meaningful reference to history, as if to wipe out the art of memory altogether. <laughs> Uh, deletion of history's traces from the urban environment is especially what bugs this writer. Uh, the Le, Corbusian, Le Corbusianization of metropolis, the tractification of suburbia, and uh, with it the preemption of slow-paced walking speed movement in space by high-speed transport uh, across spaces um, and up and down them, so you really don't notice the where of where you are. Uh, as an antidote to all this, uh, Quantrill offers uh, an interesting self-help guide for would-be uh, reconnaissancers of old cities uh, with multiple historic layerings uh, to help readers uh, fashion more robust environmental memories from the ruins of what's been partially effaced. 
And that practical thrust, uh, I think, is, is what uh, is the book's good takeaway. It raises it above the level of a sort of uh, predictable uh, anti-POMO rant, anti-postmodernism. Helpful tips on how to become your own uh, urban environmental archaeologist. Um, a related diagnosis of environmental memory loss uh, that I want to uh, concentrate on especially comes from developmental psychologists and environmental educators uh, alarmed by attenuated existential contact with the natural world, particularly among the young. Uh, the journalist uh, Richard Louvre uh, has coined the term nature deficit disorder uh, to mark the foreshortening of mental horizons and consequent long-term risks, and not only for environmental memory per se, but also, he takes it, uh, for mental and physical well-being uh, when you curtail a kid's chances to roam free in wild spaces. Well, it remains to be seen whether contact with the natural world really does correlate with the uptick or alleviation of, say, autism and ADD, uh, as this author suggests. Um, rather, as exposure to plants, natural scenes, and even images of nature has been shown to facilitate recovery from illness or surgery um, over a period of 20 years of research. But without question, anxiety about this general issue is an old theme for literary history including affirmation of the salubrity of renewed contact in adulthood with natural landscapes familiar from childhood. Wordsworth's poems of romantic recoil against urbanism uh, through memory work triggered by return, whether existential or vicarious, uh, to youthful haunts, uh, that body of writing canonized this vision for Anglophone literature two centuries ago. Uh, Henry Thoreau uh, encapsulates uh, this memorial eco-psychology uh, in a journal entry from his first summer at Walden Pond that later he adapted for the book, but I think the journal version is more revealing. 23 years ago, when I was a five-year-old, I was brought from Boston to this pond, away in the country which was then but another name for the extended world for me. One of the most ancient scenes stamped on the tablet of my memory, the Oriental Asiatic Valley of my world. That woodland vision for a long time made the drapery of my dreams. Somehow or other, it at once gave the preference to this recess among the pines, this recess among the pines. I think a passage like that goes a long way towards uh, explaining why Walden, you know, why go there? Why make such a point about its unique luminosity? Now, throughout both the journal and Walden are scores of passages that anticipate going there or later recall returning there, uh, either in body or in dream. Uh, Walden's specialness as an imagined place and its power to induce others to devise neo-Walden experiments of their own, uh, including actually my own paternal grandmother. I can say something about that in the QA. A weird case. Uh, that sort of stuff arises from the eloquence with which the book has communicated Walden's imprint as the dream place, the oriental Asiatic valley of my world, Insist, instilled at a time when, um, in the remembrance of it anyhow, no firm distinction existed between country space and personal space. Uh, this place was uh, another name for the extended world for me. Um, there's been uh, some uh, considerable developmental psychology research over the years, starting with uh, Edith Cobb's Ecology of Imagination in Childhood that claims uh, a particular sensitivity to the middle childhood years, uh, after infancy, before adolescence, as um, a time when the place imprint becomes 
uh, impressionable. It certainly fits Wordsworth, certainly fits Thoreau. Others uh, have spelled out more fully the cumulative effect of such memories over time, how childhood environmental memory returns in deepened form. Um, case I like is Scott's novelist Neil Gunn's autobiographical book, uh, Highland River, an interwar between World War I and II text, about growing up uh, in a working class coastal uh, community uh, to the north. The river became the river of life for Ken at age nine. Again, this middle childhood imprint. He never approached it but with some quickening of breath or eye. When his years had doubled and he was a soldier in France, he could more readily picture the parts of it he knew than the trench systems he floundered amongst. In zero moments, it could rise before him with the clearness of a chart showing the main current of his nervous system and its principal tributaries. In one vivid moment, it could produce that brightening of the eye that is more than the smile that follows intimate and yet aloof. Like something half remembered and with the quality of loneliness about it that is perhaps more native to man's essential nature than any other quality and that visits him finally with a strange new dignity before death. <clears throat> well, there's some mysterious tangles in that passage that I'm going to skid over uh, to make this point that three stages of consciousness are being intertwined here. The boy's excitement, the soldier's compensatory displacement of the labyrinthine trench system by the image of the river course, and the narratorial reframing that qualifies the memory as the flicker rather than a constant, and yet further solemnizes it as a definer of personal being. Uh, the return of the mental map of the riverway in the trench is more than a nostalgic flashback to boyhood uh, because the original place imprint that, as we have previously learned in this text, was intensified by the sense of danger, danger at poaching on forbidden ground uh, for the Laird's fish and game. Uh, so highland maze and trench maze, they're both landscapes of danger. This gives extra torque to that Wordsworthian reminiscence in the prelude of nature nurturing the young lad alike by beauty and by fear. Well, the environment so early imprinted as to condition adult personhood need not be pristinely natural. Uh, Grenadian American poet Audre Lorde uh, told an environmental psychologist that her own special places from childhood were first a site by the edge of the Harlem River and then a tiny park by an urban redevelopment project. And about the latter, she writes this, that place, the green, the trees, and the water formed my forest of Arden. I would write about beautiful scenes. It was the only green place I ever saw. I'll never forget after my first book, some students said, Miss Lord, would you call yourself a nature poet? And I thought, what, me? And then I realized how wedded to those images I was, and they come from this pocket park. Striking. One step further. In the post-Rachel Carson era, landscapes of despoilation and toxicity get increasingly held up as environmental memory's paradigm seems. Now, a damaged environment may be felt as no less richly bound up with a sense of personhood for all that. Uh, one of the uh, post-Carson cancer survivor memoirs uh, that dramatizes this especially well, I think, is a book called Body Toxic by Suzanne Antonetta. Uh, who spent a lot of her girlhood, the summers uh, at least, near Tom's River, New Jersey, which is a marshland district uh, in between uh, the sea and the Pine Barrens uh, that suffered, still does suffer, from some of the worst industrial pollution in the U.S. So here we go for her. I have malformed reproductive organs, tumors, weird botched pregnancies, and more. <clears throat> 
As children, even in the womb, we were changed, charged, and reformed by the landscape. What did it was the small white fish and the blackberries and the air itself. We loved things that soaked and flooded or seared and burned and wizened. Smallish and spindly needled pines, white cedars here and there, ash, a sparse tree line and brackish water, so weedy it looked like a cauldron of wigs. This really striking fusion of sprightliness and grief work going on in this passage. <coughs> now, the author can't recall these childhood romps without ruining their after effects, and yet that does not poison her exuberance at environmental memory's role in her self fashioning. Very striking. All these excerpts that I've quoted, uh, admittedly, more or less succumb to what Paul Ricoeur calls the pitfall of the imaginary. Uh, the assumption that memory must represent itself as image. This putting into images, bordering on the hallucinatory, Ricoeur warns, constitutes a sort of weakness, a discredit, a loss of reliability for memory. In Thoreau, Gunn, Lord, Antonetta, uh, such distillations in this view stand in for uh, true mimesis of remembered experience, both as a residual and as a process. And as such, and here's what I think is especially the value of a charge like recurs, they underrepresent not only memories. Uh, pre-conscious uh, dynamics and ultimate ineffability, but also a number of other processes that can be represented, such as how memory gets thin, fragmented, disowned, repressed, even faked. Subtilizations of this sort are very much on display in Ibuse Masuji's uh, great Hiroshima novel called Black Rain in its translated form, late 60s uh, translated, uh, early 60s written. This book turns on Uncle Shigematsu's desire to discharge his self-imposed duty to arrange a proper marriage for the niece he had taken into his household and uh, managed to get hired at the nearby textile factory where he works himself. Arrange the marriage in the face of rumors a half dozen years later that she's fated to contract radiation sickness. So she's a marked woman in the rumor. At the book's core are the various diaries and memoirs that Shigematsu gathers, his, his wife's, his niece Yasuko's, and other area residents too, uh, in order to prove to the go-between that he himself who became only slightly ill, was more gravely exposed to fallout than Yasuko, who was barely sprinkled by the shower of black rain. Well, of course, she really is ill. She's been concealing it for some time. And what's more, Shigematsu too is in denial, even as he writes his moment-by-moment -moment journal of the fateful day and its aftermath. Uh, the coda that he adds after the niece falters shows that he's known for a long time, but he's just refused to face how even a number of out-of-towners died from simply walking in the ruins of the city after the Holocaust. Shigematsu's obsessive yet also aversive effort to recall how nuclear apocalypse indelibly reshaped him and those around him involves a multiplex of defensive evasions, lingering on detail to avoid thinking about the big picture, hyper-concentration on performance of daily duty and banal social ritual, managing the grotesque and horrific by logging it as matter-of-factly as possible, indulging in mental roundabouts and digressions, the list could go on. One measure of the book's achievement is the contrast to the American John Hersey's nonfiction bestseller, Hiroshima, came out 
almost immediately after the war, which also takes the approach of personalizing eco-catastrophe by tracking selected intertwined lifelines. But it always stays on task, always tightly controlled within a narrow tonal range by the superintending narrative, in contrast to Ibuse's uh, dispersion of focus among an array of befuddled centers of consciousness to a fragmentary result. A black rain draws uh, at one point or another on the entire set of memory malfunctions that uh, my colleague psychologist uh, Daniel Schachter calls the seven sins of memory, namely transience, that's fading out over time, absent-mindedness, blocking, misattribution, suggestibility, bias, and above all, what he calls persistence, dogged adherence to simplistic interpretation of the event. And in doing this, uh, the novel anticipates Schachter's follow-up argument that these memory, quote, failures are also adaptive behaviors necessary in some sense for survival, uh, which is something one must consider uh, in attempting to try to put environmental memory to constructive work. Uh, whereas Hiroshima, by contrast to Black Rain, isn't much invested in memory psychology at all, but rather in reconstructing a cross-section of social outcomes. That contrast between these two Hiroshima memory projects uh, follows largely, of course, from uh, differing senses of the relative importance of individual uh, as against collective or social memory. And here I come to frame number three, environmental imagination as collective memory work. Uh, despite uh, my respect for the careful distinction between uh, social and collective memory in Jeffrey Cubitt's um, work, um, History and Memory, uh, that wants to insist that uh, social is better as a signification of the, the processes than uh, collective, which for him means false consciousness. I'm going to use social and collective memory uh, interchangeably, and you can bash me at the end if you feel that's warranted. Uh, end of pedantic footnote. Even texts as idiosyncratic as Walden also treat individual experience as incipiently representative. But for Black Rain, and especially Hiroshima, narrative of community is the more central project, the project in terms of which the individual lifeline gets figured. That Hiroshima's agenda is more uh, collectivist than Black Rain's also suggests how reinvention of the same phenomenon as rendition of social group memory will vary according to the position of the observer, of the writer himself. In this case, cultural insider versus cultural outsider. One mark of Hersey's outsidership is the extent to which his case studies get deployed as a kind of composite group portrait of an afflicted cohort. Now, a much less intimate reading of nuclear trauma than Ibusay's. Now, this difference in partiality uh, towards person focus versus group focus as your preferred unit of investigation has its disciplinary correlate in, say, the divergent pathways that memory studies predictably takes in social theory as against a phenomenology or experimental psychology. I suppose memory studies is no doubt uh, fated forever to debate whether memory is better understood in individual terms or in social terms. Uh, the first formulator of so-called collective memory theory, uh, Maurice Hobwax, insisted that no recollections can be said to be purely interior, that is, preserved only within individual memory. Against this, it's been urged, also plausibly, that group memory is a fiction resting on mystical transpositions of individual psychic phenomena onto imaginary collectives. Now, I myself favor a middle ground, a uh, middle ground position uh, that's staked out. I'm channeling uh, 
the anthropologists Paul Anse and Michael Lambeck in a critical collection on trauma and memory called Tense Past. Nice title. Uh, their position is that personal memory is always connected to social narrative, as is social memory to the personal, both self and community being imagined as products of a continuous process, both self and community being imagined as products of a continuous process. Seems to me quite sound. This does seem to be an iron rule for literature, at least. Now, on the one hand, even documentary sociographs like Hiroshima allow for some measure of differentiation among individual life worlds. On the other hand, even idiosyncratic reminiscences like Proust's of that tea time event that triggered a multi-volume fiction of memory retrieval, or Benjamin Franklin retrospectively fantasizing his future bride glancing out her genteel window upon this impecunious teenage runaway eating his roll in a Philadelphia street. Now, these are quite colorful and individuated, but they're hardly uniquely personal in that they're both, in some sense, socially conditioned framings of behaviors that are themselves socially conditioned. Well, both Hiroshima books partly belong to a sub-tradition of collective environmental memory work with long roots, but particularly salient since the one-two impact of industrial modernization and mass-scale genocide. And that's memorial reconstruction of traumatized or obliterated place-based communities. Maybe the first canonical instance in the English language, uh, you can perhaps uh, backdate this from um, other knowledges, but in English, Maybe the first is Oliver Goldsmith's late 18th century elegy, The Deserted Village. It laments the depopulation of the English countryside that was brought about by acts of enclosure or sequestration by landed gentry who were building their opulent estates. Uh, a striking case from the late colonial era is Indo-Anglian novelist Raja Rao's uh, Cantapara, which recreates the geography, ritual, social texture of a small town that was violently dispersed for resisting the Raj and the Gandhi uh, revolution. Uh, the connection between these two forms of land transformation at the imperial core on the one hand and the periphery on the other has been uh, spelt out by uh, post-colonial eco-critics. Um, two different forms of enclosure. Um, the uh, one uh, in the subcontinent uh, being displacement followed by neo-colonization of the space with uh, exurban grandee estates. Uh, Cantapara has an autobiographical subtext too, uh, in that the author, or so he said, uh, wrote it in exile as an act of both revolutionary partisanship and compensation for his own displacement. Uh, so too with the Native American Leslie Silko's great novel, Ceremony, uh, a work of imagined communal reconstitution, uh, which the author has described as a, a recreation of her home place in the American Southwest uh, from the faraway vantage point of Alaska. Uh, the slow path to cure for the returned war-damaged soldier protagonist uh, demands a series of increasingly complicated rituals of re-immersion uh, that congeal the fragmented memories that have been haunting him around an awakened sense of belonging uh, to the place-based culture of origin, uh, not merely personal, but also tribal and ultimately even global. It, it uh, converts uh, in a quite stunning uh, culminating scene, the hero's uh, memories of soldiering in the Pacific uh, into a vision of uh, transnational solidarity that recognizes uh, Japanese as kindred, 
uh, as aboriginally they were uh, across the land bridge uh, to Asia. And humankind globally as united into one by the nuclear era. Really a striking move. Uh, whereas Cantapara memorializes disintegration, ceremony reassembles environmental memory, uh, transforming it or trying to uh, from a, phys a psychically destructive force that induces chaos, as well as guilt, enemy, desire for self-annihilation, lots of bad karma, uh, transforms that into a potential solidifier of well-being, both personal and social. Um, as with the Western Apache storytelling practices recorded by the anthropologist Keith, Keith Basso in Wisdom Sits in Places, a really fine work of reflexive ethnography, key to the recentering in Silco's novel is the sense of landscape as chronotype, that is, socially shared timescape in which every niche and place uh, has symbolic significance that's encoded in a shared body of stories that's encrypted in the place names, symbolic toponymy. Well, such narratives of restoration or obliteration of place-based communities uh, have been especially compelling for what may prove to be the single most important eco-critical initiative of the last decade. That's environmental justice eco-criticism, uh, which is also one of the main bridges between first stage literature and environment studies, um, original first world concentration, and the environmental turn that we're seeing in recent post-colonial studies. Understandable bridge, uh, because of the investment of texts like Cantapara uh, in witness narratives by ecosystem people people tied to an ecosystem, as one uh, pair of environmental historians out of India call them. Um, narratives that function as carriers of so-called counter-memory. Uh, it's a Foucauldian coinage generally taken to mean subversion of orthodox understandings by invoking localized experiences with oppression to reframe the dominant narratives. Environmental justice criticism seeks to recuperate the voices, including the collective memories of the downtrodden, whether we're talking about an African-American neighborhood in Cleveland that's displaced by redevelopment, an Australian Aboriginal tribe fighting multinational mining interests, the agony of the Niger Delta pitted against shell oil and also their own central government. Uh, or the ad hoc communities of urban homeless uh, in any place. Not that collective environmental memory literature deals solely with marginal groups, nor must it necessarily reduce to critical melodramas of big white guy villains versus little non-white guy victims. Uh, that the discourse is becoming more calibrated, I think, uh, seems clear from uh, some recent work, um, case in point, Jake Kosek's uh, book Understories, which is a study of clashing environmental rhetorics over forest policy in northern New Mexico. It counterpoints a basically pro-Hispano perspective with Native American voices, radical green voices, also Forest Service spokesperson to show a kind of uh, Rashomon-like contestedness of bioregional memory in that particular place. Okay, number four, national environmental imaginaries. If you're feeling restive because I've only now come to four out of a total of five things I'm going to talk about, don't worry, please. This is going to be a short section. My key point here, designed to be provocative, uh, is that environmental memory, at least in literature, operates more readily at the scope of the local, the regional, the transnational or diasporic, even the planetary, than it does at the national. Maybe instead of readily, I should have said more uh, effectively, more uh, cogently. Obviously, national imaginaries can 
have very significant environmental dimensions, especially if your national borders correspond to ecological ones, island nations like Iceland, case in point. Even when that's not so, physical environment is often self-evidently crucial to national image formation. Indeed, even maybe especially when imagined territory does not correspond to jurisdictional unit, as in German Heimat expansionism under Hitler, or modern Chinese aspiration to assert control over the farthest bounds of empire in dynastic times, Tibet, Xinjiang, Taiwan. National memory can also become environmentalized through quintessentializing cultural icons like frontier or heartland for the U.S. or the highlands for the sub-nation of Scotland. And further defined by territorial markers that are key to national history, battlefield or treaty sites, and the lines of cultural geographic division that are chronicled in the compendium of French Vieux de, de, de Memoir or memory sites by Pierre Nora and his collaborators. Uh, in the case of the U.S., the um, inertial power of the nature's nation idea, uh, the wilderness as national definer, clearly uh, attaches itself to the power of charismatic natural sites. Um, Alaska North Slope, Yellowstone, um, the vista from Pikes Peak in the unofficial national anthem, America the Beautiful, where you really can see Purple Mountain's majesty and amber waves of grain at the same time if you turn 360 degrees. But memorial practices of this kind viewed ecologically must rest on highly selective foreshortenings of actual national ecoscapes to reductive um, microcosmic capsules, like a Bierstadt painting or Ansel Adams photograph of the Rocky Mountain West, or even the Hiroshima of Ibuse and Hersey as uh, a synecdoche or microcosm for total Japan under war. Nothing is easier than for these to fall into self-contradiction or self-caricature, such as Australian bush which gets routinely stretched to include a plethora of very discrepant landscapes. If you want to register so complex an environmental gestalt uh, as a territory the size of the U.S., uh, you're going to have to resort uh, to breathless Whitmanian-style catalogs, uh, the redundant proliferation of Sal Paradises, auto journeys, and Kerouacs on the road, uh, that sort of approach. Uh, so my provisional conclusion here is that although imagined nationness absolutely does inflect and reflect environmental memory, uh, expressive acts of environmental memory attach themselves more powerfully by and large to individual or collective narratives that render environment immersively and choreographically rather than schematically and cartographically. I can return to that in the discussion. So now I move towards a close. What good is it, anyhow? Final section. Environmental memory clearly is not an unmixed good. There are legitimate grounds for skepticism. First off, it's impossible to remember everything. And even if you could, you'd be like Borges' uh, Funes the Memorius, uh, whose prodigious memory renders him completely dysfunctional. Then, too, some element of agreed-upon forgetting, some constraint on memory work, seems needed to achieve truces, amnesty, social healing. Uh, Cossack's understories stresses that one of the big bones of contention over who gets to define heritage and future in northern New Mexico is between Hispanic dating of environmental injustice back to U.S. conquest, 1840s, uh, versus Native American backdating to Spanish conquest, 250 years before that. 
Memories of old wounds, especially, can freeze individuals and whole states uh, into melancholia. Second concern, as the paleobiologist Jared Diamond observes, environmental memory can mislead even when correct, can seduce you into suicidal behavior if you just go by what worked in the past. Third concern, environmental memory narrative, collective environmental memory narrative, like all memory work, straddles between truth and myth, opens it up to all sorts of wish fulfillment like the unkillable myth of the ecological Indian, so-called, that is, idealizing uh, a pre-contact primordium version that never was. Uh, a myth that, uh, for some reason, I can make some guesses why, elements within both settler culture and native culture have, for different reasons, tried to keep alive. With all these concerns in mind, but especially the late 20th century boom in Holocaust memorialization, uh, the historian Charles Mayer has described a contemporary pathology, as he calls it, of memory surfeit, which he takes as signaling a retreat from transformative politics into retrograde identitarianism. That this charge can apply to scholarship as well as public culture seems pretty clear from uh, the most massive monumental work of environmental memory studies to date. I've referred to it before. That's the multi-volume collaborative Lieu de Memoir project, um, often criticized as suffused with nostalgia for an organic sense of Frenchness that modernity is said to have lost. Uh, Editor-in-Chief Nora himself characterizes his project as the upshot of the fall into modernity, a distinguishing between what he calls true memory, which today subsists only in gestures and habits, unspoken craft traditions, intimate physical knowledge, ingrained reminiscences, and spontaneous reflexes, and memory transformed by its passage through history, which is practically the opposite willful and deliberate, psychological, individual and subjective, rather than social, collective, and all-embracing. It's quite an interesting case of auto-critique driven by nostalgia, the professional historian recoiling against the rigorous empiricism to which he, as historian, is supposedly committed. Uh, yeah, quite arresting. But despite whatever can be said against it, Environmental memory has constructive uses, I would argue, that can't be denied. It can be put to practical advantage by the disempowered, indeed by all social actors, as in the thousands of grassroots advocacy movements today worldwide. Politicized environmental memory work can get results, provided it gets attention, wider attention. Second, environmental memories a powerful social reality, often if not uniformly crucial to human well-being. Uh, a colleague of mine who's volunteered worldwide as an emergency physician for Doctors Without Borders and other humanitarian agencies told me that she and her fellow workers with refugees in post-conflict situations find that environmental loss often cuts deeper than human loss. And one study that I've read of uh, displaced Palestinian communities seems to bear witness the same. Uh, the village with its special arrangements of houses and orchards, its open meeting places, its burial ground, its collective identity was built into the personality of each individual villager to a degree that made separation like an obliteration of the self. 30 years after the uprooting, the older generation still mourns. Well, such memories may be liable to after the fact reshaping through socialization and personal wish fulfillment. But it only goes to show the power of the environmental memory imprint as energizer, whether to undermine, lift up, traumatize, all of the above and more. Third and finally, Environmental memory can correct against the hallucination of human autonomy, either of individual or of species, a bias reinforced by accelerating 
techno-scientific change. Any such correction can't guarantee, but it can at least help enable a greater internalized self-consciousness and collective awareness than now exists of human evolving over time within environmental contexts that are likely to continue to shape us more than we shape them. That an increasing fraction of humans, even in the so-called developing world, are not ecosystem people anymore, do not live traditional place-based lives, and do not therefore have access to the environmental markers and attendant social rituals that Pierre Nora fondly recalls, and the sympathetic characters in Cantapada and Ceremony find key to cultural survival. That arguably makes the search for renewed visions of environmental belonging all the more needful. Here, the arts of environmental imagination can be a potential resource as an activator of the sense of interdependence between the who and the where of existence. That in itself is anything but fictive, uh, which people ignore at the peril of denying not just Earth's needs, but their own. Thank you. Well, so much ground covered. Uh, there must be some sense of both things skidded over, things left out. Uh, so I would very much welcome any uh, reactions, comments, uh, amendments, friendly or otherwise. Uh, I have a thick skin and can accept chastisement, so please don't forbear uh, in your down-home Midwestern politesse. Uh, <laughs> launch in. Uh, although, uh, let me say that anyone at any point who needs to should feel free to escape with dignity. I, d I don't want to make uh, anyone feel entrapped. So um, the floor is open if uh, anyone would wish to. Yes, Scott. I was fascinated by the contrast between you drew between Matthews and Leopold. I don't know Matthews's work, but the irony is that the science that he draws on in order to situate his history within that geological history of the North American continent is the product of the mindset that Leopold epitomizes. That is, the Osage, the Osage people would, did not and would not have created the scientific understanding of the history of the planet that he's drawing on to, to, to articulate this deeper history. Uh, that's an irony. And, and the other, yeah, he's a very well-educated man. Yeah. The, the other thing that, that I, I, I found myself thinking about is the place of scientific, scientific delving into the past of the planet. It's what Leopold was doing. It's what, when they drill cores in the, in the uh, lake beds in the Adirondacks and mm -hmm. reconstruct the acidification history of, of, uh, uh, from the pollen count and so forth, or the core drilling that they do in the Arctic and they can reconstruct past climate. That there's a kind of memory there, if you will, that science is collectively, scientists are collectively constructing around the planet that's crucial to our understanding of, for example, climate destabilization. Absolutely. Uh, it's a challenge for the arts how that shall be put to work powerfully in the public sphere. I, uh, I think the uh, climate scientists, uh, or so they tell me, would, would welcome uh, uh, some collaboration there. How do you uh, make uh, climate change seem uh, like a part of lived experience, uh, for example, when it proceeds so so slowly and uh, such frivolity of response is invited when we have aberrant marches or Decembers or whatnot. Um, maybe uh, some of you, uh, particularly any of you who are creatives in the audience, hey, that's you, would have... Uh, 
would have a, a sense of how to work on that. But I, I think, uh, Scott, that uh, uh, not to belabor the issue of, of uh, climate change per se, th this is definitely one of the um, still uh, puzzling but alluring uh, holy grail prospects for, for eco-critics trying to figure out how to bring the, uh, the arts and uh, that branch of, of science together in, in uh, a way to, to make um, the environmental imagination really dramatize. Um, yes, George. Well, I'm just wondering, um, well, and I, this is a great topic, so many thought-provoking, <laughs> not just being planning. But anyway, the, uh, the, in terms of the environmental imagination and so forth and, and eco-critical thinking, I mean, there are ways in which people, you know, in local communities are always thinking about, you know, the degradation of their immediate environment and so forth. But um, to what extent is an environmental imagination or an eco-critical imagination in the way we think of it today, dependent on a global perspective. That in some sense, it's, it's not about what's happening in my neighborhood or what's happening here, but rather there's uh, the, a kind of global community has been created that creates a more, um, I don't know, I guess kind of theoretical, uh, you know, and perspective upon it which then reacts back upon the local and, and an understanding what's happening here where we are. I think both uh, the, the shrinkage of the globe uh, in the technological era and the migratory practices of humankind increasingly uh, make uh, the uh, make more imperative the uh, implantation of a sense of planetary belonging, planetary citizenship. Um, one of uh, my eco-critical confreres and, and Christoph's Ursula Heise's uh, relatively recent book, Sense of Place and Sense of Planet, speaks to that and uh, criticizes uh, the way that uh, environmental humanists, uh, particularly uh, our tribe of uh, literature people have uh, focused to such a degree or did uh, on uh, local attachment. Um, I do think that uh, from a traditional standpoint, there is something to the um, map that uh, a cultural geographer Ifu Tuan draws at one place in his book Topophilia. Uh, it's based on a, a traditional Chinese schematic where you have uh, the center is is uh, the imperial city, actually, but uh, the center could be uh, my home range if if I'm a, a, a traditionally lococentric uh, uh, peasant uh, uh, agrarian type. And uh, beyond that, they're concentric range, uh, concentric rings of greater and greater unfamiliarity. And at the outer edges, this is the Tuan map, is the zone of cultureless savagery, <laughs> completely outside what's familiar to yourself. Um, I, I think that uh, that uh, sort of imagined mental mapping of uh, place attachment and belonging uh, still has a considerable traction in the lived experience of uh, many earthlings, including even uh, many who live in this country. But uh, the future of environmental citizenship uh, has got to go in uh, the kind of direction that you have suggested. However, I think without throwing out the baby uh, or with yeah, right. What's the baby and what's the bathwater? I'm not sure I want to get to use that metaphor at all. Uh, without uh, throwing out uh, the value of uh, local attachedness as you expand 
the way you must the horizon of uh, identification and caring um, to, to the planetary. Well, I, if I can just... Yeah, you want to follow up? It, it, it almost seems like there's an intensification of this awareness uh, when I, uh, at the local level because of the growing awareness of the global level. So when mm -hmm. I was in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, for example, uh, I actually hosted a symposium at the University of Tennessee on environmental justice, and, uh, and uh, we had an incredible, you know, collection of people show up, and a lot of them were from Oak Ridge. They were mm -hmm. you know, white Appalachian, you know, uh, people who worked in the, uh, the bomb plant, you know, uh, and in the defense industry in Oak Ridge between World War II and today, and uh, we're suffering from all these problems. That we're, and there was a very local thing, you know, obviously, about it, but they also were very aware of the connection with the kind of global mm -hmm. perspective. And in a lot of ways, their, uh, I mean, their consciousness had been raised. I mean, these are people with high school educations at best, in, in some cases, and who the, the global awareness of environmental danger and catastrophe. And, and I think the bomb has a lot to do with this, uh, had impacted the way they perceived what was happening in their local place. That's very and, true. And I'm sorry. By I'm their kind of uh, consciousness, you know, their political consciousness and everything else about what was happening. That's what happens uh, at uh, that climactic uh, portion of the Leslie Silco novel that I mentioned. Um, the hero finds himself by an abandoned uranium mine, and in fact, that was the largest employer uh, at a certain point of uh, Laguna uh, workforce uh, when it was active. Uh, it's also true that it is it is the author that has to um, implant that uh, planetary awareness at that moment in the text and bring the protagonist to the point of being able to realize it too. Uh, and uh, so uh, the text achieves that kind of Oak Ridge awareness, but it also at the same time acknowledges that uh, a lot of the other figures that populate the text operate within more limited horizons. So uh, it's a kind of act of consciousness. I mean, act of consciousness raising is a fictional project, but uh, it also shows there's a way to go. Um, yes, um, can Michael. Can you comment on some of the um, kind of crass practical applications of uh, making taking advantage of this environmental memory for, say, political or or uh, advertising purposes? It seems like uh, the multinational corporations and the competing with one another to, uh, to uh, take advantage of this kind of environmental memory? Right. Well, uh, unlike uh, one of my sons-in-law, my field is not advertising. Right. Um, uh, so, what advice would you give to, uh, to an advertiser about how to, uh, how to uh, make use of this strong environmental memory? In, in I'd look for, I'd look for uh, iconic... Uh, images that seem to have some sort of memory trace attached to them. Uh, here's an example uh, that uh, relates to the climate change issue uh, that uh, I can't claim is uh, original to me, but I've tried it out uh, after getting it from a botanist friend of mine, uh, and it's, it seemed to have a, a bit of a punch for uh, the audiences that I've uh, channeled it for. Um, she has a practice of um, landscaping and is routinely telling her clients in my area, which is Boston uh, Exurb, don't plant any more sugar maples uh, because they won't be around in 50 years. Uh, and she gets a very strong reaction from that. The last time I gave this uh, instance, uh, which is at a conference at uh, Toronto, where the maple leaf, of course, is the um, 
the Canadian, uh, the Canadian tree and insignia. Um, I think turning turning that uh, into um, a narrative instance of our future uh, could be a small example of a kind of uh, intervention that uh, could could have some could have some traction. Uh, there are more tree huggers um, among us than uh, sometimes is thought. Um, if you include, extend tree hugging uh, to uh, include, uh, you know, any suburban resident that likes a nice tree that shows fall colors. Yes, Jeff. <coughs> That, that approach only targets people who have memory, which is people of our generation. Young people don't have that memory, so that wouldn't be meaningful to them. So how do you reach, I guess the extension of this question is, how can you reach young people that haven't really built up a memory in their 20s yet, so that losing maple would, would be meaningful? Sure. Uh, well, you've got to get them early, um, and there are a variety of ways to do this. Uh, Kitty lit publications like Ranger Rick, which uh, uh, our kids uh, read from the time that they could read, um, uh, outdoor uh, camping and education projects of, of certain sorts. Um, I'm uh, impressed, this is uh, a little older age of kid, uh, with the proliferation of um, outdoor pre-orientation options that uh, various colleges and universities have uh, in the last uh, 10 or 15 years uh, pioneered. <laughs> so that quite a high subset of um, uh, students to be uh, are thrust into these, and some of them uh, can just be social bonding related, but some of them have a, a serious uh, uh, Im immersion in uh, the uh, proximate uh, rusticity of the place the student body has come uh, to reside. And uh, a number of my uh, literature environment uh, students in the undergraduate course that I teach, the staple undergraduate course in that area, go uh, do these programs that they're, they're FOP leaders, uh, FOP, Freshman Outdoor Program, uh, the opposite of what you know, FOP traditionally means. Uh, now, how much good is all this doing? I don't know, but it's it's certainly better than doing nothing. Yes? Uh, Professor Buell, I feel that your ideas in many ways beautifully complement our own Professor Lynn Osborne's teachings, models, and ideas about microsystems and about local economies and local ecosystems. And I think it's our responsibility to really go out and talk to young people about it. They don't have the memory, but they have the capacity of um, building knowledge on what you teach, what Lynn Ostrom, what so many in this room teach, Scott, Thank you very much. Well, thank you. In the same course that I uh, have mentioned that I teach, uh, I have a kind of homespun practicum dimension to it, um, where I require uh, the students as part of the whole uh, menu of, of um, mandatories, in addition to regular reading and writing, to uh, stake out uh, an outdoor place um, 
and return to the same spot uh, at least once a week for at least half an hour and write um, uh, something uh, that's on a prescribed topic that's related to the environmental reading that I hope will uh, expand uh, attention. And it includes a historical component. It includes trying to uh, work up a sense of how this place has been formed and reformed over time. So um, that's something on the ground that I do pedagogically that uh, actually has been cloned elsewhere. Uh, and uh, I, th I think it, it has some value. Yes, Christoph. Why is your project still a literary one? Why, why is it still a what, When you say my project, do you mean what I just said? or Do you mean larger, the more extended project of which this is a part? Of which this lecture is a part. Um, it probably will wind up uh, having more touchstone examples from literature than other expressive media. I feel like uh, Henry Thoreau defending uh, why he's doing autobiography, and he says that I'm confined to this by the limits of my experience. Uh, but I really uh, don't uh, want or intend simply to stop there. Um, Your claims of reference are so enormous um, in terms of the text that you're referring to, that you incorporate, that it seems to cry out for a larger kind of narrative-based project that um, strains beyond sort of the literary genre as such. I love that equivocal compliment. You're so learned, therefore, uh, your ignorance is all the more pointed uh, <laughs> that you don't stretch beyond. Uh, Christoph, I would say point taken that uh, as this project develops, uh, other expressive media need to be set aside, my cameos. Anything else? Uh, your patience is exemplary. Uh, is your thoughts I welcome. Oh, my. Uh, there is light at the end of the tunnel. Thank you.